Good afternoon. Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burton. I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these pro programs, please join our membership. You can join by going to preservelincoln.org. Um, today is the 18th of a series of lectures with Jim McKee. Support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Please join me in thanking Speedway Properties for their generous support of the videotaping and other expenses associated with this series. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. He is on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. And he is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the 18th of a series of over 25 talks over the next couple of years. And the series is titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln. Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. <clears throat> John and I think it's number 18 in a series of 12. I think that's what we figured it would be original or something like that. Who knew? But they just keep making more history every day. Well, we're picking up uh, today in the 1880s, and this is the Buck Staff Mansion, uh, which was uh, on South Street at about 11th, uh, roughly on the southeast corner of the intersection. The Buck Staffs we've talked about earlier were a very prominent manufacturing and retail concern from Wisconsin. It had a lot of businesses in Lincoln. But the Poor Sisters of St. Francis purchased the Buckstaff Mansion in 1889, paying $20,000 for the house. Uh, and a few months later, they turned it into what became Lincoln's first general hospital. Now, a general hospital has a, a lot of different definitions. The one that I will use would be a hospital which would allow any practicing physician within the city or area to practice there. Up until that time, almost all or virtually all of the uh, hospitals, if there were such, were owned by individual doctors or a group of one or two doctors. And invariably, they were located in a great old mansion or a big house themselves. And uh, we've talked about a couple of them already. Uh, the other stipulation that is usually uh, used to define a general hospital is one which receives some public funding uh, for treating patients. So this is a general hospital, the Poor Sisters of St. Francis. They used the bay window in the front of the house for an operating room. Uh, the rest of the house was used for overnight stays. At that point in time, the city and the county both used it as their hospital and, and paid the sisters $6 per week per patient. It has gone up since then, I just assumed. Uh, they also were primarily for that, taking in charity patients. Then in 1891, they built adjacent to the house uh, this two- or three-story building, depending on how you look, look at it. Uh, 1891, you can see in this picture, the house is still there. And you can watch this house as it becomes part of what we think of as St. Elizabeth. The house is torn down. Ultimately, and in 1901, they begin adding on to that building. You can see it in the center here. They add on to the left and to the right uh, and just keep adding on as hospitals are wont to do. Uh, like Brian, I don't think they have ever stopped building on, uh, certainly in the last 30, 40 years. By the time they add on to the original hospital, at this point, they have a 100-bed hospital. 1913, they add on again and add the power plant. And in 1921, the east wing we see here uh, is completed, and it is a 220-bed hospital. The next addition will be on the southeast corner of the hospital, uh, and apart from it in its way, and that will be the St. Francis Chapel, literally a hospital uh, attached to the chapel or vice versa. And I'm told that if you were to go back to the interior of that hospital today, it looks very much like that last picture, which was taken by the chemical company Kelso, who provided the paints, varnishes, and cleaning supplies for it. Well, ultimately, uh, they will also add on 1928 a school of nursing building, 1953 a new south wing, and by 1965 will reach the total of 265 beds, 
and they will begin planning a new hospital in Lincoln, which in 1970 will open at 70th Street and J Street, directly across the street from the Veterans Hospital, uh, as the new hospital. The old hospital will be torn down, but as they tear it down, they realize that a separate building literally exists in the form of the chapel. The chapel was attached to the original building with an elevator shaft in between. The elevator shaft then will become, uh, obviously, the staple of a new church building. The city of Lincoln was eager to have St. Elizabeth locate the new hospital north of O Street and supposedly offered them free land where Mahoney Park is. But they chose, and this was their right, to put their hospital where they wanted to and ended up putting it directly across the street from another hospital. So here is the building after they tore down uh, the hospital itself and left the chapel. And then they continued as a separate group, put together uh, the chapel itself. I think they call it the St. Francis Chapel still. Uh, it operates as a separate chapel and still operates today. The group that put it together gave it back to the Roman Catholic Church, if I understand the exact juxtaposition. And we can see the nurses' building, which still stands also uh, to the uh, southwest. In fact, we're standing on South Street. The YMCA in Lincoln started, interestingly enough, not as the YMCA, but the YPCA, the Young People's Christian Association. Uh, by 1880, they had 13 members, and they began moving around Lincoln, meeting in office buildings primarily. Uh, the Douglas Building, for, excuse me, the Davis Building, uh, which was on O Street between 11th and 12th, uh, was one of their first homes, and they paid their $12.50 a month as rent. And of course, you don't want to keep paying rent like that forever. You want to have a building of your own. And in 1887, uh, they acquired the southwest corner of 13th and N Streets, as we see here, and began constructing the building we see, uh, at which point they had 500 members. We can also see in this building, looking slightly to the right, we can see the top of uh, St. Paul Methodist Church without its dome on it. And we can also see the Lindell Hotel to the left. And to the left of that, we can see either the First Presbyterian Church or the First Congregational Church because they sit side by side on 13th Street. This was an interesting time in this McDonald picture. The streets of downtown Lincoln were paved with primarily brick. And we also had, instead of gutters in all the corners, which ran into storm sewers, some of the gutters had little bridges over them, uh, so the pedestrians walked over the flow of water. This is also an intersection, which is the one last one, I think, in Lincoln, at least the last one that I can remember. Um, traffic department might tell me differently, but it still had stop buttons on the corners. And on the northwest corner of the intersection was one of the stop buttons, which I remember very clearly because I hit it. And the stop button was a piece of steel, about 18 inches tall, shaped like a bullet. Uh, and it indicated you were supposed to stop. And in turning the corner, I turned a little too sharply and bumped into it. That's how I remember it was there. Long since disappeared uh, as scrap metal, I'm sure. Uh, the building was not completed until 1892, so it took a while to build. It cost a total of $60,000. Uh, at that point in time, Dr. B.L. Payne of Miller and Payne, which I think we talked about last week or last month, uh, was the president of the YMCA, and he purchased a mansion called the Whedon Mansion, which was on the northeast corner of 13th and P Streets. So they were going to move towards the north. He then gave that mansion and the house, or the property underneath it, to the YMCA, uh, and they will then move from this building first temporarily to a building we'll talk about in a minute, which is on the south east corner of 13th and P while they're building the new YMCA at the site of the old mansion. So in 1905, they'll move temporarily out of the 13th and N building and begin to build the building, which most of us remember is the YMCA building at 13th and N streets, excuse me, P streets, got to stop and think. Uh, first, they will build a two-story brick building on the corner and next to it, a wooden appurtenance to the north up to the alley. Uh, we can see the two buildings here in an unusual building. 
picture, uh, and it got more unusual as I discovered that the prints which I had didn't have the negative, and the prints were printed backwards. And it took Ed Zimmer and I considerable head scratching before we realized that, in fact, the prints had been made upside down. And that wooden section, which was the running track and gymnasium, was to the north of the building, which is later where the ultimate uh, swimming pool and running track will be. So we're looking at 13th Street. We're looking towards the east in this picture. Then we'll complete the building. We'll tear down the wooden portion of the building. We're looking towards the north, northeast in this picture. Uh, complete this building uh, approximately in the 1906-1907 uh, period of time. The old building will be purchased by the Free Press, F-R-I-E-P-R-E-S-S-E, -E -E, which is German for Free Press. They will begin printing not just the Free Press newspaper in there, but uh, also several other German uh, newspapers, some dailies, some weeklies. And at that point in time, uh, before 1910, Lincoln will become the largest, I think it's called a third or fourth class, post office in the state of Nebraska, in that more newspapers were mailed from Lincoln. Uh, than any other post office, which would, of course, only be Omaha. But we had a tremendous number of newspapers coming out of Lincoln. Most of them would be weekly, but there were several daily newspapers, the largest of which, of course, other than the ones we think of as dailies, was Williams Jennings Bryan's The Commoner, and it would have been printed in this building temporarily. Uh, in the 1930s, that old building over on <clears throat> N Street will be torn down, and the Chapin building will be built in there called the Chapin Building Number 2, which used to have Rupert's Drugstore on the ground floor, uh, later became uh, Savings and Loan, and later, of course, became the infamous Tier 1 Bank, which we've had interesting stories about in the meantime. Uh, so after this building is built, uh, the Y will continue to expand. In the 1950s, the YMCA will purchase a building at approximately uh, 60th and South Street, which is the old Roberts Cheese Factory building and it will be turned into a branch of the YMCA. Uh, 1960, Bennett Martin uh, will purchase the old Capitol Hotel in the city of Lincoln. Uh, part of that will be given to the YMCA. They will use the old hotel for a brief time as a YMCA hotel. Uh, they will tear down the ballroom and build a swimming pool and running track. Uh, then in the 1970s, they will build another YMCA on North 70th Street. Uh, then ultimately the final building will be built near Southwest High School uh, to the southwest of Lincoln Memorial Cemetery. Um, next in this property, the YMCA will be torn down. Uh, however, the YMCA by this time will be long gone. Uh, Douglas Theaters will build a two-screen or three-screen theater in there and offices. Uh, turns out to be not a very permanent building. It will be torn down and it will become empty and become a park in which ultimately June Canico's tower will be placed in it. This is an interim period. But the interesting period to me was when they tore down the YMCA building in order to build the Douglas Theater building. And my office at that time was at 1320Q and I ate every day at Y at the Miller and Payne. Uh, cafeteria. So I walked by 13th Street every day at noon. And as they began to tear down the building, uh, as I went to lunch one day, they had a crane over on the uh, P Street side up near the top, and they had the steel ball on the back of it, and they swung the crane around and hammered the building with that steel ball. That was when I was going to lunch. When I came back, you'd like to think the building was gone. But when I came back from lunch, they were still hammering away at the same spot on the same building. Uh, and later I talked to the man who tore the building down, who got the contract. I think he got $80,000 contract to tear the building down. Uh, and I think it cost him something like three or four times that to get the building out of there. And he said he did learn a great deal about tearing down buildings uh, and demolition at that point in time. Because one thing which he had failed to do was to go inside the building and discovered that virtually all the interior walls were not only load-bearing, would report reinforced concrete. He said the building, that's where you would want to have been if there was an atomic bomb dropped on Lincoln. That building was absolutely permanent. And so when they tore it down, it turned out to be a great problem. But the theater building didn't need that much work to come down. And of course, the June Canico Tower is in there now.
57 foot, and I don't have a picture of it, but it's almost not history. It's so uh, the gold department store, Gold's department store. William Gold, the first gold in the department store business in Lincoln, was born in New York in 1864, and at age 14, his family moved to Hampton, Iowa. At that point in time, he was working uh, in another store at a dollar fifty cents per week. Uh, but in 1884, they moved to Sutton, Nebraska, and William began to work at Lewis Stam's dry goods store. Ultimately, he purchased that dry goods store. And in 1902, he moved to Lincoln and partnered with a man by the name of Cohen, becoming Cohen and Gold, and their store at that time was at 112 North 10th Street. Uh, 1903, uh, he will move to O Street. We see this on the south side of O Street between 10th and 11th. Um, and it will become Gold and Company. Mr. Cohen moves on, a 5,000 square foot building originally with 16 employees. Uh, this is uh, 1029 O Street, and of course, three stories above ground and one below. Uh, then in 1924, they begin building around that building and build the seven. This is another picture of the same property, and we'll be talking about Mayer Brothers probably next time. So we won't include them this time. First National Bank building is on our right to give you some idea. The Mayer Brothers building you see there will come down, and the W.T. Grant building will be built in its place, and that's now the Senior Center. Uh, kind of a dark picture. This is standing <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle of 11th Street, just to the uh, south of O Street, and we're looking towards the um, northwest. We're now beginning to build the seven-story corner building, which is 35,000 square foot store, uh, and there are 150 employees at Golden Company at that point in time. Really dark picture, and this is a uh, picture sadly taken at night. I hope it turns out better when we uh, put it onto the uh, YouTube scene. Uh, it's the building which you would recognize as standing there now. I don't think you did a very good job of duplicating that slide. That's probably John's. Uh, the last part of the building, which will be built, will be Gold's Food Basket, uh, which is over on the uh, northwest corner of the intersection. We're looking towards the northeast in this picture. Uh, we can see First National Bank on the left. Gold's was sort of form not a complete U, but uh, pretty much of a U. Ultimately, will occupy more than a half square block of the block. Uh, by the mid 1950s, they have 350,000 square feet of retail space there three-quarters of a square block, and uh, around a 1,000 employees in this type of building. Uh, in the meantime, they will have purchased the square block directly to the south of that building uh, and torn down the two-, three-, and four-story buildings which occupied that building uh, block, excuse me, to create a street-level, ground-level parking lot, which is now gone. But that parking lot was interesting because when we look in the middle of it, we discovered that one of the things that now William Gold's son Nathan has done is to sink a well dead in the middle of that block. And that well was to supply water for the air conditioning tower for Gold's three-quarters of square block buildings. Uh, it didn't turn out to be a very good investment because, as we all know, when we drill a well in downtown Lincoln, if we don't drill it precisely the right depth, we're going to hit salt water. And this is about all they were ever able to get out of that well was salt water, which literally was like acid in the air conditioning cooling system and the pipes, and it uh, was not usable. So as they turned the block into just simply level parking, we can still see in the middle all the electric connections and stuff leading down to that well. And I presume uh, when they ultimately cleared it to build, is it latitude or longitude, <laughs> the new building that sits there, I can never remember which it is. Uh, I suppose they found, if they dig much below, they probably found the casings and so forth of that well. So at that point in time, they'll have a square block of parking uh, and the three-quarters square block because you want to keep everybody downtown at that point in time. You don't want to go out to some of those new upstart shopping centers which are just about your building. But unfortunately, they do. And in 1964, Goals will sell to J.L. Brandeis, and of course Miller and Payne's downtown uh, will sell to Yonkers. Both of them have agreements which say the downtown stores will remain open. Uh, however, as we know, neither one ultimately did, uh, and they will move to the shopping centers. 
Now we're back to the building uh, which would be the temporary home of the YMCA after they moved from 13th and N over to their 13th and P building. This building stood on the southeast corner of 13th and P streets, where today we have the Stewart building. It's actually two different buildings called the Halter Block and the Furniture Block. Uh, originally on that site, of course, we're at the east edge of the city of Lincoln. So at that point, originally stood houses, uh, and on the corner was Mrs. Tweedy, Mrs. Tweedy's boarding house, which had been a large mansion-like house, southeast corner of 13th and P. And in 1893, Mrs. Tweedy's mansion was torn down for the five-story furniture block, um, 128 North 13th Street, and they advertised themselves as Nebraska's greatest mail order house. I have no idea what that means, uh, but they mail-ordered stuff out of the building, for sure. Then in 1895, the halter block was built on the corner uh, next door so that the two buildings stood as one. And it housed primarily the Lincoln Overall and Shirt Company. Then January 25th, 1905, the temperature was 12 degrees above zero, sort of like what it was last night here, and a fire struck originally probably in the right-hand side building, uh, and the building is going to ultimately burn down, uh, primarily, again, because the water that the fire department was using to put out the fire was literally freezing as it came out of the hoses. So it was a very, very difficult fire to fight. Uh, they said it threatened the Lansing Theater across the street to the west uh, and probably partially other buildings around it. We know that on O Street, the side of this, which would be to the right or to the south, uh, that several buildings were threatened and even fire uh, broke out on the roofs of those buildings, but they did not burn uh, to the ground or anything. But the fire chief was on the roof of one of those buildings and fell through and broke his leg. So it was a tough fire to fight. Uh, at this point in time, there was a city ordinance of some sort. I don't know exactly how city ordinances worked at that time. But there was a city ordinance which allowed the fire department to hire people walking by to become firemen, like firemen for the day. In fact, they could literally conscript you as a fireman. They could say, Wayne, you're a fireman, and you literally had no choice. Uh, later on, I had a friend who was county attorney out in Adams County, and he said at that point in time, it was still the law that if you couldn't raise a jury, he would go out to the, the mall and say, you're a jurist. Uh, and I guess they can still do that in small counties. All you had to do was prove that you were a uh, uh, resident of the county. But at any rate, they could, they could literally conscript firemen, and they did. Eleven men were conscripted to help fight the fire. However, the city did reimburse those men. Those 11 men worked all night long and into the next morning, and together they split $17.50. So it's well worth it. Uh, the building was a complete loss, however. And if we look at some of those pictures, we can see the sign YMCA even is temporarily on them. Looking at the same building here towards the northeast, and we're probably standing about where the National Bank of Commerce will uh, pop up a little bit later, and we can see... Uh, it was a brick building, so you would not think it would have burned, but whatever was inside it would have burned very well, whatever they were mail ordering, all the wooden fixtures, doors, window frames, and so forth. So it, it is literally a complete loss. So on that property, then, is built, or are built, two buildings. The building on the corner will be the Seidel's Buick Company building, the original one. Uh, 1905, Harry Seidels and Charles Stewart had a Cadillac agency in the city of Lincoln, uh, and they built this building for their new Buick franchise in the city of Lincoln. Uh, this is also about the time when the Great Depression comes on that General Motors is being formed, and General Motors, of course, in Detroit is a combination of Cadillac, Chevrolet, Pontiac, and so forth, and as they brought these businesses together to form General Motors, Cadillac and Buick were two of them that they brought together, but their timing was both perfect and imperfect because the Great Depression was knocking on the door, and one of the first things that General Motors realized was they were out of money, they were on the verge of bankruptcy, they came to Lincoln, talked to Mr. Stewart and Mr. Seidels, and borrowed money from them to make the payroll. So the Stewarts and the Seidels and Lincoln together, underwrote the payroll of General Motors. 
And in exchange for that, they were given a couple of things. Uh, they were given a franchise for Buick automobiles, not just for Lincoln, not just for Nebraska, but for Nebraska and portions of Kansas, Iowa, the Dakotas, and the states which surrounded Nebraska. Now, that sounds amazing when you really put it in perspective. Uh, they received that instead of getting a cash payback for the money they loaned them to underwrite the payroll. Because uh, my suspicion is that General Motors says, okay, we're ready to pay you back. And the stewards and Seidel says, no, that's all right. Instead of paying us back, give us this franchise. And they're then going to build the building, which we'll be talking about in a couple of months, which we call the new Buick building, which is the much larger building occupying almost a quarter of a square block on the northwest corner of 13th and Q Streets. Uh, that was the next Buick building. And on paper, at least, every Buick that came from General Motors and went into one of those uh, surrounding states, at least on paper, went through that building. So if you ever wonder where the Seidels and the Stewarts got their money, that's one of the sources. It was a very lucrative franchise, which ran out, of course, uh, subsequent to that. Uh, in the meantime, the Lincoln Overall Insured Company will uh, regroup, and they will build a new building, which we'll see in just a minute. So we also have the Lyric Theater building just to the right, which would be on the alley, uh, to the right or to the south of the Nebraska Buick building. Originally, Seidel's had parts stores and stuff to the east of this, uh, which they're going to give up when this building is built. We'll talk about the Stewart building in probably three or four times from now. It comes out in its place. Lincoln overall in shirt will build a new two-story above ground and complete sunlight basement on the northeast corner of the next block at 14th and P Streets. This building is still there. This is also the building under which approximately, maybe nearer the center of the block, was a one of the many, I should say, artesian wells or springs that uh, existed all over downtown Lincoln. Uh, of course, the old lake bed is here. And we had many, many springs and artesian wells putting up water. This supposedly had a four-inch head of water. And we know that that four-inch head of water from there was drained by tiles under this building, through the intersection of P Street, underneath where later the National Bank of Commerce will be built. And we talked about this some time ago. It will go catty corner from the northeast towards the northwest under the block, which now houses uh, Wells Fargo Bank, crosses the intersection of 13th and O at a, at a diagonal, crosses next to the old theater building, and dumps into a storm sewer, which parallels O Street, which runs between N and O, straight down towards the west and empties into Salt Creek. And that um, storm sewer, Matt, we, Refresh my memory. I think it's probably at least five feet tall. Uh, your father has pictures of it. It's brick and stone and arched at the top. Still exists. And when I was in the university, probably in the 60s, they tore up O Street. And one of the things they did was they discovered that that artesian well underneath this building was still putting out fresh water. So as they tore up O Street and laid a new pipe to carry that water away, they had to keep damming it up and working around it where they laid new pipe, but it still apparently drains into that same storm sewer uh, and ultimately out into Salt Creek. So this is the building, the Lincoln Overall and Shirt Company. They existed there for decades until it became uh, the Goodwill. It became a used car lot. It became the Fraternal Order of the Eagles building. Then it became the Rock and Roll Runza. That's the Runza restaurant where they had weights on skates. I don't know how well that worked, but uh, uh, waiters on roller skates. And today the building <laughs> occupied by Noodles and Company and a couple of other restaurants. The second floor is Shea Hay. Uh, the basement is uh, occupied as well. But looks very much like this. They've just had to change the entrances so that you don't have all those staircases and a little ADA work on the building. This is the building just a little bit later when the Nebraska farmer occupied it and uh, the building next door to the east, which is now the Children's Museum. 
the canard buildings, which I'm sure we've all noticed as we walk by just directly across the street, catty corner from the building we're in today, the northeast corner of 10th and K, was one of a couple buildings built on spec by Thomas Perkins Kennard, who was the first Secretary of State of the state of Nebraska, and we know him from his Kennard House, uh, which is next to the Ferguson House, catty corner from the Capitol building to the southeast. That was Mr. Kennard. Uh, Mr. Kennard uh, came from uh, the village which we know now as Kennard, Nebraska. Don't ask me why we pronounce his name Kennard, but the city's name Kennard, I don't know. I don't know that anybody does. But Mr. Kennard started several businesses in Lincoln, built a couple of buildings on spec. This is one of them, uh, the, so the northeast corner of 10th and K Streets. It's had a number of tenants through the years, never anything owned by Mr. Kennard, as near as I can tell. The upstore, upstairs uh, was virtually always apartments, uh, usually as many as six apartments. The ground floor was many, many different retail establishments. A grocery store, we have a picture of the interior of it as a grocery store. Most of us remember it as Marl Interiors. Uh, and Marl was down on the ground floor for quite a long time. Uh, and while he was in, in the building, the city fire mar or the county fire marshal, city fire marshal, state fire marshal, somebody required him to remove the staircase along there uh, for reasons of fire. And it's one of those fire escapes which is removed by the, uh, ordered by the fire marshal. So that's the only part of the building which if we look at it today, we don't recognize the building. Instantly we can see canard up on the top. This is also the building which about 30 days ago was run into by a truck and did great damage to this close corner right here. But now it's been repaired and what was the stone is now a piece of formed concrete that looks pretty much like stone. Uh, for a while there it looked like they were questioning the fabric of the building, but believe me, that building was built very well and, and stood being run into quite a bit. Um, now it is an attorney's office on all floors. The lower is primarily uh, used as storage, but the upper floors are operated by an attorney firm. Mr. Kennard also uh, built another building. Uh, this was another spec building, uh, 12th and L Streets, about 1889, 1890, something like that. So in the same frame as the Kennard Building Caddy Corner from here. Uh, it too would, uh, had upper floors which had apartments and offices in it. In this picture here we have two people standing in front and it happens to be taken as the editorial offices of the commoner. Uh, and the two people in front when we look at a better picture of the people standing there are William Jennings Bryan and his brother uh, who was the mayor of the city of Lincoln uh, at that point. So we find this building, another Kennard Building, uh, which also operated for a time by Mr. Kennard's son-in-law, Mr. Riggs, R-I-G-G-S, who was a druggist. And Riggs Pharmacy was located in a couple of other places in Lincoln, but also in this building as well. Uh, Mr. Riggs uh, divorced Mr. Kennard's daughter, and so on the, the schism occurred. Um, and this building was used for other purposes than the drugstore at that time. The last major tenant was William Jennings Bryan's The Commoner in this picture. And this building is long gone. The third building which he built would be the Western Paint and Glass Company building, which survived a good long time. And again, we'll be talking about that in a month or two. I don't think we have a picture on it. Uh, the next building will be the story of the Lincoln Telephone and Telegraph Company. Uh, we're looking here at a building which stands, which was not built by the Lincoln Telephone and Telegraph Company. It was built by the Bell Telephone Company. Uh, the Bell Telephone franchise came to the state of Nebraska in 1877 uh, in the guise of a man by the name of Mr. William Corty, K-O-R-T-Y, who lived in Omaha and obtained the franchise for Bell Telephone for the entire state of Nebraska. Uh, originally, much of what he installed were what we would think of today as two tin cans on a string. In other words, just literally like an in intercom. Uh, in Lincoln, for example, one of the very first telephones ran from the Burlington station to the uh, home of the owner of the Lincoln newspaper. Uh, and also another line, a separate line, went to the newspaper office. And the story went that when uh, he had a party in his home to celebrate the fact that he had, by golly, a telephone, even though it only connected to the station, that he threw a party at his home that night. And in the party he had in the dining room, in the center of the table, he had a large floral display 
and in the middle of the flowers he put a telephone receiver. And then back at the depot he had an orchestra playing, so that it was broadcast probably not very strongly, uh, but it was an amazing thing for the day. So most of those original telephones were not connected to anybody except two parties. Quickly that's going to change, however. The first exchange in Lincoln uh, will come in 1880, April the 25th, and at that point in time there are 65 Bell telephone subscribers in the city of Lincoln. Uh, and the exchange will be on the second floor of the Holmes block at 11th and O Street. Now an exchange means for the first time that any one of the 65 parties that have subscribed to the phone company, you can talk to any one of the other 65 people, not just one other party. So the telephone line will go into the exchange and then you'll have a drop. This line can be plugged into literally 65 holes if you'd like to look at it that way, uh, or come down and plug back into you. So that's an exchange. That's the first exchange in the city of Lincoln. Um, at that point in time, telephones were $3 per month for a business was worth four dollars. So three dollars for an individual or a home, four dollars for a business, which really was a pretty stiff penalty at that point in time. 1895, the Bell Company will build this building on 13th Street, just south of the alley. Uh, you can recognize it today because if you look up above the floors, right in the middle, there's a large stone bell uh, still there. Uh, you might think of it as lt and but it was built by the Bells. Uh, by the time they build this, there will be about 800 telephones in the city of Lincoln. So the number of telephones will increase very, very quickly at that point in time. 1903, along comes a man in Fairbury uh, by the name of Charles Bills, B-I-L-L-S, and he decides to start his own independent telephone company in 1903, and he hires a just-graduated attorney to be the attorney and draw up the papers for this telephone company, and that young man's name was Frank Woods. So he draws up the incorporation papers. The telephone company's name is the Western Union Independent Telephone Company. Uh, I, why they chose the name Western Union is, is another mystery. Uh, almost immediately, their new firm has 204 subscribers, but Mr. Woods decides, along with Mr. Bills and other uh, incorporators, that one of the things they will do is offer free telephone subscriptions with the promise that they will charge you nothing per month until they get 1,800 subscribers. So, obviously, this attracted a lot of individuals. Um, they did get 1,800 uh, subscribers very quickly, and they will then build their first building, this is the alley side of the building. We can see the staircase, which interestingly enough was the only way to communicate originally with the ground floor and the second and third floors. There was no interior staircase. The switchboards were on the upper floor, uh, and to get to the second floor, you had to go on the outside staircase. Then there was an in interior staircase to the third floor. It won't be until they build an adjacent building to the south with a staircase in it they will be able to communicate within the building and the exterior staircase is still there. However, the last I looked, they pretty much blocked it off on the ground level, uh, probably to prevent transients getting in there more than anything else. Later, uh, the Woods brothers will acquire the building, and they will build the building to the right, which is modeled on a um, conservative investment company building in New York City, and now you will be able to enter the door in this building and go to the second floor, and communicate to the upper floor of the old building as well. Um, let's see, this building, I forget the time frame on, it's quite a little bit later, because I think the slides may be out of order slightly, because this is actually the first Lincoln Telephone Company building to be built in Lincoln. Uh, this will be in the 200 block on South 14th Street. Uh, it will be on the west side of 14th Street facing towards the east, uh, and it today is part of a ground-level parking lot. Uh, but still, up to that alley, this is where all of the telephone cables came originally. Um, they will start charging, when they get the 1800 they will start charging $1.75 per month, so a little more than half of what Bell was charging at that point in time. We'll also find an interesting point in Lincoln history, because 
for a while there, there will be two telephone companies operating, the Bell System and the Western Electric, or excuse me, the Western Union uh, Telephone Company, will be operating simultaneously. However, if you had a Bell telephone, you could not communicate with anyone who had a Western Union telephone. Two separate switchboards, two separate exchanges. So if you were a business, particularly a business that, like a doctor, for example, where you would find it necessary to communicate with everyone in Lincoln or in a department store, you would have two telephones. So as we look in the early part of the 20th century, uh, clear up into the uh, early part of the 20s, we'll see telephones listing two, or businesses rather, listing two telephone numbers, Bell and Auto. So you cannot communicate one with the other. 1905, uh, they will change the name to the Lincoln Telephone Company. Western Union will be gone. And at that point in time, they will install something new called the S-T-R-O-W-G-E-R, Stroger Automatic Dial Telephone. Now, this means that they can replace switchboard operators with people who have correct telephone equipment. And this is the old dial telephone which meant that you could dial 15 and be connected to number 15 instead of having to go through the switchboard. Now, at that point in time, still, firms are listed in both, but Bell did everything they could do to stop businesses from having two telephones. They made all sorts of concessions to try and get people to stick strictly with Bell. But, of course, the dial telephone is coming in, in well. Um, Unfortunately, with the installation of the automatic dial telephone came an increase in fees from $1.75 a month to $2 a month. Now, a lot of things happen at that point in time. Bell is going to lower their fee down to the same as uh, the Lincoln Telephone Company in order to compete with them. Uh, then in 1909, uh, Lincoln Telephone uh, will have as a president now Frank Woods. Frank Woods will also be elected president of the National Independent Telephone Association, and he will become known as the Great Independent nationwide. Uh, Lincoln Telephone is a, sort of a pattern for other independent telephone companies all across the United States. 1910, Bell discovers that by lowering their rates, they're actually losing money on everyone who is a subscriber with them. Uh, one of the things they did in Fairbury, for example, was in order to try and keep the businessmen associated with Bell, was the Bell Telephone Company opened a grocery store in Fairbury at which they sold everything in the store at or below cost to demonstrate to the grocers that they needed to be on Bell. Well, it didn't work. Uh, it, it didn't work at all. Uh, 1912. I'll be the next major change we see. And in 1912, uh, Frank Woods will write a check to the Bell Telephone Company for $2,293,000, the largest check ever written at that point in time in Lancaster County. Uh, uh, Frank Woods Corporation, the Lincoln Telephone Company, will give up the telephone companies that they operated in Grand Island, Fremont, York County, and Howard County. They will give those to the Bell Company with the check for $2,300,000, but they will get back from Bell all of the Bell Telephone franchises in 22 counties in Nebraska. So, uh, great changes in student. Through the years, uh, Lincoln Telephone will be very, very much on the cutting edge of telephone or telephony, telegraphy. They will institute the radio telephone. Uh, they will institute national dial-up where you can, in other words, dial anywhere in the United States. They'll be one of the first independents in the United States to have that service. They will be one of the first to install WATS lines, W-A-T-S, Wide Area Trans Telephone Systems. 9-11 will be one of the things that they come along with. And 9-11, Lincoln, Nebraska, was one of the first cities to come up with a 9-11 system. And they will be one of the first companies to begin to install optical fiber. So they were very much uh, in the business of refining the telephone as well. Uh, then, in uh, 1980, they will be the 37th or the seventh largest independent telephone company in the United States, with over 300,000 uh, subscribers. 
In the meantime, they will have been moved many times. They will have built several buildings, including uh, the one directly to the south of their original building, which was a two-story, then three-story building. But all of those buildings, including the old Banker's Life building, were torn down and, for reasons unknown, are still not built as anything but surface parking. And those properties belonged to something called the Sahara Coal Company, which you've never heard of. Tim maybe has, because, of course, the Sahara Coal Company was one of the holding companies of the Woods Brothers and uh, held the real estate. And they still hold the real estate, as far as I know. Uh, unless somebody knows differently. They still own that ground floor parking. Why they haven't developed it, I'm unsure. This is the building to the left of their original building. Uh, towards the end, this had a restaurant in it. I remember we used to go on Sundays, and then ultimately they will build their new building with that funny tower up on top over on Centennial Mall. This building, the one to the right, which is the original Lincoln Telephone building, will be torn down. Uh, the buildings over on 13th Street will change hands. We'll have a restaurant in there called The Exchange for a while, and now you know why it was called The Exchange. Uh, now I think uh, Dwayne Ackley may own those two buildings, uh, or at least uh, one of them on 13th Street. Uh, the next uh, property we'll talk about is the Hardy Company, Hardy Furniture Company. Uh, Harvey Hardy came to the uh, city of Lincoln in 1871 when the population of the city was 800. He came from Kansas and he was warned by people uh, when he came up here not to come to Lincoln. They said that town is very apt to just blow away in a cloud of dust. But Harvey Hardy nonetheless came to Lincoln and opened his first store in Lincoln at 800 O Street. Uh, which was known uh, in the city directories when he listed where his building was at 800 O. He called it the West End of Lincoln, or the West End of O Street, or the West Edge of Lincoln. So right on the edge at that point in time. Uh, in 1876, Mr. Hardy was elected to the Board of Education of the city of Lincoln. 1877, he was elected the mayor of the city of Lincoln. He won by 100 votes exactly. And he gave $300 of his annual salary to the Lincoln Library, which at that point in time is going to become a city library because it will receive funds then later from the city of Lincoln as well. Um, after he runs once, uh, he runs again. And the second time he runs for mayor, he runs on a temperance ticket. Lincoln Dry is his motto. At that part in time, Mr. Hardy had a, a partner as he often did in Lincoln. Uh, and if you collect antiques, you may have seen uh, fans and ashtrays and rulers and so forth, which carry the name Hardy and Pitcher. And Hardy and Pitcher uh, was the firm. Now, this reckons back to the days when in the small towns, particularly in the Midwest, the furniture dealer was quite often the mortician. Mr. Hardy is sometimes referred to as a mortician, whether he himself was or not, I'm unsure, but he always at least had a partner who was a mortician. Mr. Pitcher was a mortician. And at that point in time, uh, and he had many partners, but Hardy and Pitcher lasted about the longest, and at that point in time there was another faction in Lincoln opposed to temperance called the Saloon League, and they were very popular and very powerful. And one night, the Saloon League left on Mr. Hardy's front door a coffin with a note tacked to it, warning him to back off of his attack on the saloons. Mr. Hardy takes the coffin, sells it to Mr. Pitcher for $13, takes the $13, gives it to the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union, and is again elected mayor of the city of Lincoln. Lincoln goes dry. Uh, in fact, there are postcards. You probably, Matt probably got one that says Lincoln dry uh, on a picture of Abraham Lincoln there not raising a stein of beer. Um, and it was dry during his tenure, but as soon as he was no longer the mayor, Lincoln went wet again, if you will. He was the first mayor uh, in a period of time to leave the city treasurer, treasury with a surplus in it. It was well thought of at the time. He ran again for mayor, but lost that time. Uh, at that point in time, he ran for the governor of the state of Nebraska on a prohibition party ticket, but was not over. Uh, 1887, Hardy and Pitcher, and they will move consistently. You find all of these firms in Lincoln, if you look back at Miller and Payne, they probably moved six or eight times. Hardy and Pitcher will move several times. Hardy's themselves will move several times. 
and they will move in this picture to South 11th. Now this building is in the Gold's parking lot block, if that helps you identify it. Uh, and one of the three-story buildings in there, they also had next door to it, they had a four-story building. So that as they grow, they accumulate buildings to either side. Uh, also in 1887, uh, Harvey Hardy sells the furniture business to his son, Edwin. And he lived at that time in a home on Calvert Place, which was, an, and still is, an amazing house. Calvert Place is off of Calvert Street to the south at about 36th Street, 35th Street. It's a large tract of land, probably close to 8 or 10 acres of land. I'm looking for somebody to correct me on the size of that. But Calvert Place, his huge house is, if you get off of Calvert to the south, you can see it right there on the right-hand side, brick driveways, and all of the land around him, about 10 acres, belonged to Mr. Harvey. Um, and then through the years, they have sold off other parcels of land in there. Dr. Weaver had a home and so forth. There are probably about, about five or six houses in that area now, but it's still a private drive, Calvert Place, off of Calvert Street, and you really ought to go take a look at it because it's a really interesting little area. Mr. Harvey's, uh, Harvey Hardy's house, right on the right-hand side right there. Um, in 1950, uh, it's now uh, the uh, son, Philip Hardy, uh, and Philip Hardy will buy another mansion in the city of Lincoln. He will buy the Stewart Mansion, which has two different addresses, 1040 South Cotner or 1040, uh, uh, I think it is, Crestline, Crestdale. I can't remember what the street, but at any rate, it's really uh, on South Cotner, but it sits in a, where the Cotner curves towards the northwest, and it's had two different addresses here. Think of it as 1040 South Cotner. I remember it because of the 1040 form of the federal government, which William encouraged me to keep filing. Um, Philip Hardy is now going to have moved the store over to O Street, and he will have, he and his father will have bought two buildings on the north side of O Street between 13th and 14th. Uh, we can see them here. Uh, one of the things he will do is he will now put a unified front on the two buildings, and it will look like this. And it's still very definitely two buildings, but they'll remodel it again, like this. And now it really does read as one building, but the two buildings are still behind uh, this facade, uh, which also I think it's one of the parts get an, gets an extra floor added on at the top. So it's remodeled so many times that you can hardly tell uh, it's the same building. And it's been remodeled again in 2009, 1980. It just keeps getting remodeled. But go to the alley side of this building. Uh, and if any of you, Ed and I did an alley talk walk one time, I think you were honest on that. Uh, and we look at the alley side of that building, and if you look at the alley, you can still look up above it. They keep remodeling it, but you can still look up and see those two very distinct separate buildings. 1973, uh, Hardy's will close on January the 1st, of 1973. An interesting date because on that date, Hardy Furniture was exactly 101 years old. And I asked the man who then operated uh, for them, a man by the name of Bill Kinsey, uh, if they had chosen that date on purpose knowing that Hardy's was 101 years old. They had no idea that Hardy's was 100 years, one years old. Uh, Bill Hardy went to work for the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., as a dollar-a-year man, and he then sold his mansion to a Roman Catholic group, and it, is it a, tell me, John, is it the Bishop's Home? The Bishop's Home uh, on South Cotner Boulevard, and the Bishop, uh, of course, filled in the outdoor swimming pool, uh, but other than that, the house is pretty much as it stood. He's added a chapel or church to the south edge of it, but that is the original Hardy mansion. The Pink Sisters. Okay, so is it a nunnery then? Would you call it? But the Bishop's Home is elsewhere then. Okay. I think the Bishop's Home was there for a while. Is that correct? Oh, we don't know. Okay. That's the answer often. Okay. We've come to the end of our hour, but there uh, is time, our, there is time for a few questions if there are any. And Wayne always has a question. I don't know what I I 
Uh, Wayne's question is, was one of the Hardys a Unitarian? I believe so, but I can't speak with authority on that. Uh, I, it sounds right, but I, and so if someone in the in the audience can answer that for me, I would have any Unitarians out there. Roxanne? It is. Let me see if the next building picture... No, I'm sorry. That gets on to the next one. Uh, it became Union Savings and Loan, and then it became a bank. I think it was... It was several different savings and loan bank institutions. Now the upper floors are apartments, condominiums, maybe some offices. And on the ground floor in the alley, my granddaughter has a yoga studio. Uh, and in the, the primary on the, on the ground floor, there is a tiny little kind of a restaurant bar that, a fruit bar, not, or a, not an alcohol bar that she owns. But an awful lot of that first floor is now empty. And I'm not sure that there's anything on the O Street front of the building right now. But the building still stands, has a completely new facade, reads again as one building, and is directly to the west of the University Towers parking garage and directly to the east of what used to be the J.C. Penney building. Okay. Another question. If not, I am not sure exactly when... Number 19 will come, but it'll be a couple of months. Watch your postcard, and uh, we will let you know.